the Emperor Reg study, it's estimated that the people that were in that study would comprise only about 16% of our patient population. So let's sit down and talk about the other 84%. And so when we're talking about you know, the options and, and all of the options that, that um, Julio and, and Bob and Vivian have talked about, you can sit down with a patient and talk to them about the pros and cons of the different therapies. Doesn't take more than about two minutes. And you know, and I know, that almost everybody is going that can afford it will be focusing on agents that help them with their weight. My dear you know, Dr. They, Wishing, they, the, <laughs> the other 84%, they probably, a lot of those people have unrecognized cardiovascular disease. So I, I am just explaining that <laughs> if you are going to restrict the, those therapies for patients with cardiovascular disease, that you're missing, you're missing 84% of your patients, some of which, yes, are gonna have unrecognized heart disease. But when you focus on the different options for patients and allow them to help make the decision, they understand, they understand that there's options. And if this doesn't work, I don't have, I have side effects with this, they know that they can come back and say, this didn't I, work I agree me. with Carol, those 84%, they may well have unrecognized heart disease, but they were not included well, in the trial. They are, I know those trials sure, are going on. I know for sure that metformin, and an SGLT2 will give you weight loss, will not give you hypoglycemia, will reduce your, your blood pressure, and so on. I want to, I want to see studies being done in people. They are being done. Uh, they being are. done They're in done. people with risk. But, but we I still, to, I I'm going to go beyond done. the thing. They're done. They're done. <laughs> They're, they just haven't been reported yet. We're yeah. going to have them just, in June. Just have the vision. The job's not finished till the paperwork is done. Yes, the paperwork isn't done. That being said, We've been talking about weight. Now, when I, I remember some of these drugs early on, and there was this weight loss reported with them, and we were all cautioned, don't put too much, you'll pardon the expression, weight mm -hmm. on the weight loss component. It may be ephemeral, it may not be significant, but you're telling me, in fact, it is significant. Is weight a significant issue when you start prescribing these drugs? It's a huge issue for the patients. They, you, you, you know, I think it's ironic. You give, tell somebody you need to be losing weight, and you give them a prescription for a drug that makes them gain weight. I think that's just, it's you know, cruel. contradictory. It's, it's cruel. It, yes, and then they and then they feel guilty coming back with weight gain. So if so, if weight, someone's struggling with weight and wants to lose weight, choose a drug that will cause weight loss. And although Julio says that you know SGLT2 inhibitors are good for this, there are better ones. GLP-1 receptor agonists are far better at weight loss, not in everybody, but in a significant number of people. I, I yes. should also, let me, let me just say that the, the weight is really important, but preventing weight gain is what we're doing. We're not inducing huge weight loss. It, with any of these medications you're aiming for, you're getting about two, three, four percent body weight loss with benefits, but not dramatic benefits. What you're preventing is the natural history of weight gain that occurs in almost all patients with diabetes. But, you know, when you use agents that accelerate weight gain, then you have a disease that is already prone to obesity or weight gain, and you've accelerated that. But, but, but we're talking about non-injectables. And with the non-injectables, the only one that gives you weight loss is an SGLT2. And very consistent, because you have a, a, a loss of calories and it has a glycosuric effect. You lose 60 or 80 grams of calories, so you're in a negative balance of 200 to 300 calories a day. And you've seen study after study after study losing two kilograms that is sustained, which is important. All right, and tell me about hypoglycemia. You alluded to it, you all did. How does the risk for hypoglycemia impact this decision with all these agents? Where do we go with this? I, I, think, I think preventing hypoglycemia is extremely important. I, I think that in the oral agents, the biggest, I mean, what we've always, most of us have been trained with was originally sulfonylureas. And, especially the early sulfonylureas was horrible hypoglycemia, but it, if that's all you had, the other, that's all you had. And uh, they got better over time with some of the second generation S sulfonylureas. But now in the having being able to use agents that are more as effective or, or more effective perhaps in multiple areas than the SFU sulfonylureas has been a boon. You don't have to worry about the low blood sugars in these patients. You can tell them very confidently that they may have a blood sugar of 65. In fact, I would think that that, you know, if you, in some individuals, but that's not going to hurt them. And it is true. I mean, let's be fair with the sulfonylureas. I'm sure that there's been 
bad, bad, uh, uh, giving a bad uh, image and so on. But if you use a low dose of glimepiride or glipizide, I mean, and you have a normal renal function, I mean, they're not that bad. We are actually doing a study where we're comparing glimepiride versus uh, linagliptin, that is the Carolina trial that is going on for five, six years that is going to look at the cardiovascular events because that's the other issue about the sulfonylurea, the effect on cardiovascular disease. We're also using glimepiride in the GRADE study. Yeah. Huh? Yep. We're using glim glimepiride getting, in the GRADE study. Getting back to your question on hypoglycemia. I'm so glad somebody's getting back to that. I actually think there's two issues related to hypoglycemia. One is how often they occur and how often they're recognized. And the problem that most providers fail to ask patients about hypoglycemia, and most patients either don't recognize their hypoglycemia or feel that it's the price to pay. So that, first of all, providers have no idea how frequently their patients are experiencing hypoglycemia. The patients are experiencing it, and they are likely doing whatever they can to avoid hypoglycemia. They don't take as much medication. They eat bedtime snacks when they don't need to have snacks. Yeah. So I think hypoglycemia is the, is the biggest barrier for treating our patients aggressively when we're using agents that put them at risk of hypoglycemia.